So welcome to the second part of the Teensy FX video series. Uh, last time I showed how easy it is to get started with the Teensy 4 doing audio with the Audio Shield, and I decided it was worth making my own PCB to get the type of control functionality that I wanted. So in this episode, I'm going to look at the schematic capture, the PCB layout, uh, some mistakes I made, ordering the PCBs, building the PCBs, and then a quick look at the results. So let's get started with the schematic. So I use KiCad and I've recently upgraded to KiCad 5 for doing uh, PCB design and one of the new features I like about KiCad 5 is that you can drop images in. So I grab the schematic, thanks Paul for making that available, um, and the, uh, the pinout of the Team C4 um, and got started with a symbol for the Team C4. Um, where I basically just um, use these global labels to connect the various pins to where they've got to go. And then all the work is done in these two sheets here. So the audio sheet is uh, mostly just a copy of the adapter. Uh, there's a few interesting things here. So um, trying to do some filtering of the audio supply with an inductor and get some capacitors on here. Um, we've got a 1.8 volt supply here, uh, it's also well decoupled. Um, I added the headphone jacks for the input and um, the uh, line out. So the adapter uh, PCB from Teensy just has the headphone out and I wanted to try the line out as well. Um, then uh, this is the audio interface. So you set it up with um, the I2C, so that's how you configure the chip. And this um, uh, um, codec is quite an interesting um, little bit of gear, actually. Um, if I just grab the schematic. Um, it's got quite a lot of stuff that you can do inside. It's even got some of its own audio processing, like you can do EQ and stuff like that. I've not had a look at that. Um, but it's got some interesting signal routing and I had to dig into that a little bit because I'd made a mistake on the um, schematic and I couldn't work out what was going wrong. So what I did was um, I managed to mix up. So one thing you should also know is that um, I'm not sure if it's corrected yet, but um, on the schematic, the data in and data out pins were mixed up. So um, when I asked for a design review on the um, Teensy Forum, I got some great feedback from a member called Palmer or a Neurofun, um, and they alerted me to this um, D and D out thing. So I fixed that, and they gave me some also good information about types of capacitors to use and audio stuff because I've not done much audio PCBs before. Um, but I did manage to mess up something, which was even though I've got everything nicely labeled and all the pins were correct on the symbol, um, I mixed up B clock and LR clock. So they were the other way around. So that's fixed on this version of the schematic. Um, okay. And the only other thing that's worth talking about here is um, uh, there's a resistor in series with M clock, and that's used in case we need to control the rise time a little bit of the uh, master clock for the I2S. So that's running at 12 megahertz. It's fairly high frequency, and the rise time is important. So I heard an interesting amp hour episode that I'll link to below where they were talking about um, I2S and uh, what you need to watch out for. And the master clock is definitely something you need to watch out for. So having a footprint to be able to, if you don't need it, you can just replace it with a zero ohm resistor. But if you do need it, it's very handy to not have to cut traces to be able to do a little bit of control there. Um, so let's jump out to here. Uh, and that's also, that was included and mentioned in the forum chat. Um, about the development of the uh, adapter board. So that is necessary for that board. I'm not sure if I need it or not for this board. I'll show you some waveforms in a minute. And then this sheet is the control. So I've got four buttons directly wired. Thinking about it later, I could have put them in on the analog MUX here uh, in these unused channels. So this um, chip is basically, you give it an address using these four address lines and you can choose which of the 16 inputs gets routed to the multiplex. So I've got one ADC, 
I'm using on the Teensy, and then scanning all the pots, which are here. They're on 3.3 volt rail. Um, and then I found a Texas Instruments LED driver because I wanted to have nice, smooth PWM. I didn't want to use the um, kind of intelligent LEDs because they're too big, uh, but I didn't want to have to do uh, loads of legwork with the, um, the Teensy because I wanted it to be able to focus on the audio stuff. So with this, you um, just shift in. It's like a shift register of and each... Um, it's 24, controls 24 LEDs, so you shift 12 bits times 24, and each 12 bits is the PWM level for each of the LEDs. And that works really nicely, very easy to use. It can drive much more current than I need, um, but it was available in a nice package, um, not too expensive. For noise reasons, I power the, all the, um, the LEDs off a 5-volt line that I've um, got a little filter here. So I've got an inductor and a capacitor to try and get any LED switching noise off the 3.3 volt line, which is used for the pots and used for the audio. So I'm trying to pay attention to uh, noise and immunity because I want the audio to sound good. So I think that's pretty much all I need to talk about for the schematic. So let's jump into the PCB. I found some 3D models for the pots and for the Teensy. Um, I, one thing I like to do is put a short link on the board and I have a export script that will look for a dollar get dollar text and replace that with a git uh, commit that when the board was produced. So that lets me easily go back and look at previous versions of schematics. One thing I should have spotted from having the 3D was that when you use it like this, you can't really see the LEDs. So actually, I've uh, taken to using it uh, like this. So for the next revision, I'll move all the LEDs to the bottom and probably put the buttons on the bottom as well. But I was able to check all the footprints and check that the Teensy fitted properly and there was enough clearance and stuff like that. So having the 3D models is definitely good. And uh, I'd like to say thanks to Kipling. Uh, they posted this little... Um, uh, bit of code which is the context free grammar on the context free website and I created this nice pattern which is available on a, a share alike license so I've used that uh, many thanks for that um, and uh, here we have the layout so I decided to go for a four layer board for immunity and signal integrity reasons so I've got my um, internal layers here uh, both ground decided to go um, both grounds. Um, I was reading up on um, electromagnetic compatibility engineering by Ott, and I highly recommend this book for learning about um, electromagnetic compatibility and immunity and noise and that kind of stuff. And one of the uh, interesting parts in the PCB chapter is he lays out um, six important objectives for multi-layer boards. And uh, this is a common thing with engineering. It's very difficult to get everything that you need in terms of like, like a classic one is cost, quality, and time. You can choose uh, only two of those to have together. And with PCBs, he's got these objectives. And he says that without a large number of layers, like eight or 10, you can't actually get all of these six objectives satisfied. So you're having to make um, compromises. And um, there's an interesting comparison here with... Um, uh, the typical um, signal and power on the top and then ground planes in the middle versus putting ground planes on the outside. And with uh, ground planes on the outside, you can satisfy four of the objectives. And with this, with ground planes on the inside, you can only satisfy three. Um, so if you look at the pocket operator, you can uh, check uh, with a multimeter the top and bottom planes are, are ground, so they've gone with that. Um, and um, if you look carefully around the edges, there's these tiny little holes, vias. So they've done via stitching all around the outside and made like this Faraday cage to contain everything. So I think that's going to be really good for immunity, which is what you want for good sounding audio. And they'll need to pass FCC and CE. So that helps with the emissions as well. So I decided to go with this though, because I wanted my signal wires easily accessible in case I made a mistake, more easily fix it. If your signals are inside, it's more difficult to get at things. 
Um, so uh, what, some of the uh, other feedback I got on the design review was to move all of the audio stuff into its own block and try and keep that as isolated from everything else. So that's why it's on its own at the top with the headphone jacks. Uh, there's the master clock um, resistor here. Um, one thing that is, you know, I've mentioned that the Teensy is very useful because it's just an off the shelf thing you can plug down on the board. But one of the downsides is that um, you've got problems with routing. So this 12 megahertz um, clock is important to get the routing right. Uh, keep it short as possible, have a ground close underneath it. Think about the, uh, the return path. So the return path for this though, is gonna want to follow the signal back, but then it's still got to move over to this ground pin here and then go probably further along to the chip that's on top of the board. So that's like the loop that I can't control. Whereas if I put the uh, chip down myself, I could control the uh, ground rep return path much more easily. And it's the same thing for the I2S in and out signals. You know, they're down here. I'd probably rather that they were up here and keep them all together. But I don't have a choice of where they are because they're on this already laid out board. Um, then there's the LED driver. There's the pot multiplex. Here's all the pots down here. And there's the filter for the um, the LEDs to try and keep that noise off. I went for really fat traces on the five volt and three volt lines, given that I didn't have a dedicated power plane for them. So I think that's probably about it for the um, PCB layout. Um, as I mentioned, I use an export script so that my uh, exports are always the same and it generates a, a PDF and a, a PNG for the uh, manufacturer as well as information about the layer stack up and stuff like that and um, turns that dollar git dollar into uh, the uh, the git commit at the time that the board was um, exported. So then I load that up onto um, PCBWay. They're the guys I normally use. And uh, in 10 days, I get the PCBs back. These are a bit more expensive than normal because they're four layers. So um, I think it was $50, including um, delivery for, four layer, for five four-layer boards and the stencil. And um, they arrived and look good. So um, that's these and the stencil and uh, I'll take you through some photos. If you do want to build one of these yourself, I've got two PCBs spare. So get in touch, I'm happy to post you them. Uh, you need to be happy with QFN soldering. It's not too difficult though, uh, but some surface mount experience is good. So what I do, uh, I got a stencil because I'd hate doing that um, solder paste with the syringe. Um, so I um, hold the board very firmly and that's something that I've learned is important for the pasting is to, when you put the stencil down, you don't want that, there to be any movement at all. So then I go with quite a low angle to start with, with a lot of pressure. Um, try and really get the paste through the holes. That's why you need everything taped down so strongly so stuff doesn't move. And then I'll come back at a higher angle uh, and scrape any excess off or if I see there's any holes being... You can see the way the stencil's lifted up a bit there. It's not totally flat. And I think that led to some bleed through. Um, and then here's the result. So I've got put pretty good detail on the QFN, um, but on some of the other uh, chips, uh, I got a few bridges after soldering, so I needed to clean those up with some braid and some flux, but not a problem. Um, I mentioned I got the um, the left and the left right clock and the bit clock uh, mixed up, so I've put some instructions on here on what I needed to do to fix that. So remove two pins of the teensy, and then flip the wires over. So I fixed that on the schematic and the Gerbers now, but if you get one of the older PCBs and you want to build this, you're going to need to do this fix. The last thing I want to show you before we finish the video is some results. So I got this scope on the I2S clock. So I'm sorry, these pictures are quite small. Um, and my scope only has a bandwidth of um, 70 megahertz, but um, it's plenty for this 12 megahertz I2S clock. So you can see the shape of the clock's pretty good. The rise time is um, controlled with that 100 ohm resistor, so we're not getting too much ringing um, at the top there. 
you, I put an FFT down here so you can see uh, we've got this first frequency at um, 12 megahertz. Um, and then I was interested to see how much that bled through onto the audio. Um, so I turned down the frequency a lot. So now um, the, the step per division is 5 kilohertz now. So if you look on here, we've got 5, 10, 15, 20. So this is kind of audio frequency on this left-hand side of the screen here. And there's, there's really not much there. Um, I did find one little um, peak that I put the cursor over, uh, but that's at um, minus 70 dB down. So that's pretty good. And I didn't really, this, um, this is now on the um, input uh, phono uh, mini jack, and I've turned up the sensitivity to 50 millivolts. So it's pretty low noise. Um, a lot of that's just gonna be the noise of the scope. Um, the stuff I'm concerned about is kind of um, high frequency uh, signals coupling from the digital part of the design. And then this is on the output. So there's, there's, no, there's nothing really there, nothing um, significant that's happening. Um, and I've got it um, plugged in here. So I'll just play you. I'll just turn up, I'll turn my mic down and turn up the sound of this and we just record the sound of it doing nothing. So mic down. So that was at maximum output level and it's really nice and quiet. So I'm pretty pleased with the results of the, uh, the PCB. So uh, that's all for this time. Uh, next time I'll uh, do a longer demo of it in use. Hope you've enjoyed the little musical interludes. They're all done with the uh, pocket operator rhythm, sub and my effects unit, the Teensy FX. And uh, next time we'll uh, talk about um, the firmware and that'll be a wrap. So see you then.